9. Libra, Tower 182. Today, Roundwater was invaded. The invasion was swift and unexpected, emerging from an unprecedented source, the Gates of Roundwater. The realm of Phalanx had been hinting at war all summer long, threatening to cross out into the Sun Kingdom. But our spies did not detect any unusual preparations for war against Roundwater. Little did we know that Phalanx had developed a powerful ally among the spheres. An army of sphere walkers called the Locusts has entered Roundwater through half a dozen gates, all to keep the other kingdoms of the realm from assisting the Sun King in warding an incursion from Phalanx. These Locusts have raised several villages already and appear to be marching on Everway. The Keepers are hard at work identifying which gates were breached and the number and distribution of the enemy forces, but we know precious little right now. I have sent the Crows to mustering their soldiers, and the Watchers are conscripting citizens to guard the walls. The Crook Stars are seeing to our magical defenses. All known Sphere Walkers are to be detained and questioned. I have stressed to the Council the necessity of assembling a trustworthy group of Sphere Walkers to serve the Crown and help repulse the invading Locusts. With powerful Sphere Walkers to arrive so easily within our borders, Roundwater's position is precarious. We must counter their threat for the good of the realm. Excerpt from the Chronicles of the Crown, Reign of Skyreach Tower. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. In 1998, the Swedish hardcore punk band Refused released the album The Shape of Punk to Come. To say the album was controversial at the time is a bit of an understatement, some critics outright refusing to review the album due to its divergences in style versus what was considered punk. Despite that, it would serve to be massively influential in the music scenes that came up in the early 2000s, as well as several artists in and out of the punk scene citing or referencing the album. Even to this day, the album still holds up quite well, despite its rocky reputation in its early days. You may be asking, why am I bringing up a 90s punk album when I don't usually review music? Well, it's because anyone who listens to my podcast will know I love making parallels and contrasts, especially with things that don't exactly fit traditions. This brings me to Everway, which in its original form was considered a diamond in the rough out of pre-D&D Wizards of the Coast. Originally released in 1995 under their Alter Ego label by Jonathan Tweet, Everway was a groundbreaker that spearheaded the idea of a story game as we know it. While it wasn't the first, arguably that was Good Guys Finish Last, it is certainly one of the most influential. Last year, Everway made its return with its Silver Anniversary Edition, created by the Everway Company. This version was funded through Kickstarter and launched with a new set of rulebooks, as well as a brand new Fortune and Season deck along with it. Technically, the Silver Anniversary was in 2020, but let's not talk about that year. Anyway, it is this version which we'll be exploring, now that it is in the hallowed halls of my temple. Now, in the interest of disclosure, I will note that I had backed this new edition on Kickstarter, and I've had Jonathan tweet on the show in the past. As always, that will not play a factor into my assessment. With all of that said, it's high time we dive into the self-proclaimed mythic visionary and see how it's held up. Everway is a big boy. With a player's handbook and game master's handbook both running close to 400 pages each, there is no shortage of content, both direct and supplemental. Artwork is somewhat reused from the old books, but a lot of it isn't, and is still really, really top-notch, reinforcing the Greek mythos leaning that Everways had for the longest time. Also, you know how I've complained about navigation in some of my reviews? Not a problem here. Bookmarks? Check. Index? Check. Hyperlinks? Oh, that's a check. That one rarely shows up. I'm not going to do a text comparison between this version and the original, but the book is littered with expanded concepts and clarifications that were highly requested by the fanbase, as well as cleaning up some of the original text with modern editing techniques. The book is also highly colorful, but not in a way that's going to make my eyes hurt, especially with blue being a primary color in the background. Bottom line, there's no problems with the presentation. Given the narrative leaning of Everway, character creation is rooted in interpretation than hard numbers. We'll be exploring this with Aldine in six stages. First, the vision stage. This is essentially the GM's setting of the tone, and the player's introduction to the setting the GM is presenting. As such, it's the one we'll be glossing over for the same reason I glossed over similar steps in other games. I'm not going to be player and GM in these experiments. Second is the identity phase. This is divided between name, motive, virtue, fault, and fate. 
Name is self-explanatory, and the remaining ones are rooted in the fortune deck. I'll explain what that is later. Motive is the answer to the question, why is this character traveling the spheres? And is based on the star part of the fortune deck. Now we drew Venus, and thus our motive is beauty. Virtue is described as something they're gifted at or with. Now we drew the dragon, meaning our virtue is cunning. Fault is described as something you're not good at, be it a personality flaw or some sort of curse. This will typically be drawn as a card's reversed meaning. We drew the unicorn reversed for this, so we'll use temptation as our fault. Lastly, fate. This is the hero's goal and is intended to be a neutral card. In our case, we drew the king, which can be interpreted on a case-by-case -case basis. Third is the powers stage. Powers are any form of supernatural ability that is either inherent or rooted in some item. The cost of a power is determined by three factors. If it's a frequent power, if it's a major power, and if it's a versatile power, or any combination therein. The more these factors apply, the more points it costs. Beyond that, a power can be almost anything, with GM approval, of course. We'll start with six points total, and in our case, we'll go with Mastery of Winter 3 and Ice Dragon Heritage 3. Fourth is the element stage. The four elements are the base stats of a sort, but instead of being presented as a modifier, it represents the scope or scale of influence they have within that element's purview. Characters start with 20 points in the four elements, and no more than seven points can be put in any one element. In our case, we'll go with Fire 7, Water 5, Earth 4, and Air 4. Each element has an associated specialty. When that specialty is applied to an action, the element's rating is treated as one higher than it is. In our case, we'll go with Swordsmanship for Fire, Diplomacy for Water, Survival for Earth, and Spiritualism for Air. Fifth is the Magic Stage. Magic could be considered a fifth element of sorts, with its own set of rules for spells as agreed on by both player and game master. Developing magic always denotes the choice or creation of a magic tradition and an associated element. However, Aldine is not a mage, so we'll be skipping this step. Sixth and final is the question stage. Essentially, this is a series of questions between game master and player to flesh out their character. Character creation has a lot of dressing, but the actual numbers are pretty simple. That said, depending on the style of character creation you're used to, it might result in an adjustment period. It's not exactly something for the beer and pretzel style of slapping a random character together. If anything, it's like a Mad Lib. I've always been a little iffy about the difference between powers and magic, but that's something I addressed in my interview I did with Tweet. However, I hinted we'd be delving into the fortune deck, so let's do that. In most of my reviews, I've talked about a game's core mechanic and then delved into the things around it. Everway, however, is not one of those games. Whenever an action is taken, a card is drawn from the fortune deck, and both player and GM interpret the results based on the card drawn. As for the individual cards, it's somewhat analogous to the tarot in general, and in particular the major arcana. Each card is associated with one or two elements, and sometimes a zodiac sign. There are 36 cards in total that are arranged in a set of tiers, of which there are 8 in total, from the most to least common in the deck. These tiers are deities, the great truths that represent the domain of a god or goddess, estates, the societal roles of humanity, beasts, the mythical beasts that represent the principles governing actions, follies, the resistant forces opposing change, seasons, the interconnectedness of nature and the elements, animals, the aspects of body, mind, and spirit, duality, the principles of balance, and void, the missing force in the universe, sometimes filled temporarily with an usurper force. Much like in the tarot, each card has a regular meaning and a reversed one. For example, the defender represents safety, but the reverse defender can represent peril. That's it. No pass-fail or degrees of success, just an answer to what happens next. This is what makes covering the core mechanics tricky by most metrics. Even though the fortune deck is the randomization mechanic, which is why I don't consider Everway a diceless game, it is one that has to be interpreted by the GM and player. Fortunately, there's a fair amount of examples throughout, but this is still going to be an adjustment issue for a lot of people. This might be a bit of a stretch, but I suspect the majority of people who know about RPGs have the mindset that the randomizer determines whether you pass or fail, not how things play out. I'm reminded of when I did my review of the Star Wars games by Fantasy Flight Games, and how people at the time, and still do, scoff at the symbol-based resolution, until they played it themselves and realized there were a lot of new avenues of narrative potential within that system. I'm not saying the narrative dice in that game are better or worse, but it's a classic case of relying on tradition as a security blanket. That's why I refer to it as an adjustment period, one that's going to depend on the GM to steer the ship. 
Everway as a narrative system on its own or as a companion to other games has a high level of potential that's almost limitless, but there's two big asterisks to it. First, the game is going to be dependent on the GM's ability to keep things from getting out of hand. Without everything is open to some form of interpretation, and the fact that this is borderline a universalist game, this could be a recipe for disaster in the wrong hands. Universal leaning games already ask a lot of the GM to keep the munchkins out, and I do think that certain types of play styles will not fit the game, specifically the more pickup styles that are so common in certain types of old school play. Second, the game is very reliant on the fortune deck. While there's a nice little box on each page in the book with a random card from the deck, it's clear that the game is meant to be played with a physical copy of said deck. People are often uncomfortable with game-specific material, see what I mentioned before regarding FFG Star Wars, and the requirement of a specialized deck will certainly not help on that front. I'd imagine that virtual tabletop players will have an especially interesting time, since using card draws on something like Roll20 can be a bit... jank. Not full Slav jank, but jank nonetheless. Even with all of this, I'd still give Everway Silver Anniversary Edition a stamp of strongly recommended. Despite some of the hang-ups, there's far too much imagination within these pages to pass up. As mentioned, it works well on its own as a storyteller game, and just as well as an ideas companion for other games in one's library. I will add the caveat that I recommend getting it alongside the Fortune deck, or even better, Fortune and Season deck, as I feel they'll play to the game's strength as a whole. It's safe to say that Everway has earned its reputation over the years, and I'd like to see what others do with this revival of its concepts. Stay frosty!